that thank you. How does that look? Very good. We can see you, we can see your slides, and we can hear you. So you're you're good to go. All right. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, my name is Douglas Thane. I hail from the uh, University of Notre Dame. I'm I'm very disappointed that I, I can't be there uh, in Madison for Condor Week. Um, missing summer in Madison, uh, sitting on the terrace, and and I hope to see uh, hope to see you all next year um, as we get back into a more normal travel schedule. Uh, so, so the title of my talk here, uh, I always thought a condor talk uh, is it has an, requires an obligatory bird reference. Uh, so I'm going to talk about how many eggs can you fit in one nest, uh, and and the subtitle is dynamically shaping high throughput workloads, and this is work done uh, with uh, with uh, Ben Tovar from uh, from Notre Dame and one of my students, uh, Tan Sun Fung. Uh, let me start just by saying a little bit about how we use HT Condor at, at Notre Dame. Uh, so we have a, a, a central um, campus organization for scientific computing called the Center for Research Computing, which uh, rard, lard, runs a large cluster on behalf of, uh, of the entire campus. It's run on a, a condominium model. So uh, faculty who acquire uh, clusters of, of of uh, varying sizes, work with the CRC to procure compatible hardware and put it all together into one big shared cluster where the owner gets uh, a first crack at the use of those resources, but then of course uh, that's shared with the entire campus. And then the university contributes a, 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 a fraction that's, that's shared with everybody. And so we end up with a, a cluster of about uh, 20,000 cores of a, a wide variety of architectures and capacities and GPUs and, and networking capability. And so it's a very interesting playground in which to look at heterogeneous computing. Now, um, due to my friends in uh, mechanical engineering and uh, uh, exploring fluid flow problems, there's a fair amount of MPI work. And so what we do is we run a different batch system on the front end in order to schedule MPI jobs and play the game of Tetris to pack them all in. And then we run uh, HD Condor uh, on, on the other end, in order to backfill high throughput computing jobs uh, in between all the uh, all the MPI applications, and depending on the time of year, uh, anywhere from 10 to 90 percent of the the uh, cluster is available for high throughput computing. As it turns out, uh, this time of year at the beginning of summer, there's a lot of capacity available, and so all my our students are very eager to submit lots of jobs and get things going. Uh, this little snapshot here just shows a, a state of our cluster from some time back on a particularly busy day. And, and so you can see that there's a wide variety of jobs of different sizes. Uh, each, each box there is a running job and each color is a different user. Now, usually when we think about high throughput computing, usually the, the, the first mode of use that comes to mind is a user that interacts directly with the system. So, uh, you know, I want to run a thousand simulations. So I sit down and, and compose my HT Condor submit file and get my executable together and and submit a thousand simulations, and then uh, you know, uh, I'll lovingly interact with Condor Q and the log file to to see what's going on and track all my jobs. And then when I get them all back, then I I, I care individually about each one because it represents a data point in my uh, in my eventual uh, publication. And and certainly this is an important way of interacting with the system. But a lot of the applications that we've been studying over the the last several years, um, I'll, I'll, I'll call them dynamic workflow applications. And what I mean by dynamic workflow application is an application that sits outside the cluster and it generates work for the cluster. Uh, so it's going to generate jobs of some kind to send off and run in, in some uh, high throughput mode. And those jobs are going to run, complete, generate some result, come back. And rather than the user considering every result, it's rather that the workflow considers that result and then perhaps turns around and submits more jobs. Uh, and this might be used to um, explore a complex topology. It might be performing some kind of optimization. Um, in any case, it is the application itself that is consuming the results and generating more jobs. And it will run for some time until it has reached a stable state, until it gives a result back to the user. And so from the user's perspective, they're using the cluster, yes, but really they're just starting one application that turns around and uses the cluster as a gigantic multiprocessor. And from the user's perspective, they're starting one thing and getting one result. So we call this a dynamic workflow application. 
because we don't know the entire structure of the workflow from the beginning. Rather, the workflow evolves as it runs. Um, so, so we developed some software for building these sorts of applications at Notre Dame. Uh, it, it, it's called WorkQ. Uh, you can check out WorkQ here. And uh, on, on the right hand side there gives you a, a sort of high level view of how to write a, a, at least a simple WorkQ application. And um, actually, I don't know, are you able to see my pointer on the screen? Hearing none, We're waiting for. If you can yeah, see, we my can see the, we can see the pointer fine. Yeah, okay. So just to give you an idea of how it works, you write a little Python program where you, you define a queue up the top here. And then if you want to define some jobs here, we'll say for in range one to a hundred, define a task. And in this case here, the task is an executable, we'll pass in a parameter. Here we'll specify how much memory the task needs. There are lots of other things you can specify about a task and then submit it to the queue. And then you can wait for things to come back from the queue. Uh, and when they do, you can process their outputs and go around and submit more jobs. And so that's that's the basic structure of a of, of a work queue application. Um, tasks can look like executables here, or uh, a recent addition is we can make them just plain old Python functions. So if you just define a Python task that refers to a function in your application, then we'll figure out how to package up that function and all of its dependencies and run it somewhere else. And so it, it's it's an easy way to define uh, highly concurrent dynamic workflow applications. Now, the general architecture of this sort of application um, looks like this. Um, sometimes we call these pilot jobs or, or glide-ins or, or overlay applications. They go by many different names. But the way we consider it is that you have access to a resource like your campus HD Condor pool. And you go to that Condor pool and you deploy some workers and these worker processes are just um, uh, generic programs. They're not specialized to your application. They can work for any work queue application. Uh, but maybe you have access to a bunch of other resources too. Maybe you have access to um, a private cluster, some jobs, some machines sitting in a closet somewhere. Maybe you have an allocation on a DOE machine or, or maybe you go to, to Google or Amazon to acquire some machines and, and you run some workers there. And uh, these workers sort of gather themselves together into a, a, a personal cloud, if you like. And now over on the left here, uh, when you run your application, it defines some tasks, gives it to the work queue manager, and it will go and distribute those tasks out to the available workers. Now, of course, in order for these things to run, um, they're going to make use of some files and programs that you likely have defined locally at your submission point. And so work queue will take care of the business of getting those things over there um, and sharing them among the workers, dealing with the outputs and so forth. And so your tasks run and eventually you get results back to your application, um, you know, just in the form of function call results that you can process and keep going. So that's the basic architecture of this sort of application. Uh, we, we've helped build a wide variety of applications in this style uh, across um, many different domains. So we work with some friends in high energy physics, which I'll be talking about in, in just a minute. We've done some work with hyperparameter optimization um, uh, for, uh, for um, neuroscience, uh, um, some work with uh, molecular dynamics, uh, optimization of force fields, computational chemistry. So there's all sorts of things that can be built in this sort of framework. All right. Now, that's just the basic architecture of the system. Today, I, I wanna ask a, a simple, but very challenging question that comes up in this sort of application and, and really in any resource management situation. A user comes and wants to run a specific task. What resources does that task need? And, and by resources, I mean, you know, any component of that execution system that needs to be consumed in order for the task to succeed. So we usually think about the quantity of memory or the number of cores that you need or what kind of GPU that you need. But this can be extended to other things like um, um, you know, network capacity and storage space. So what resources do you need in order to run a given task? Now, as you know, this question is terribly important for scheduling because it controls where you place tasks. It controls how many tasks you run. It controls whether the tasks succeed at all. Now, uh, when I had the good fortune to uh, become involved with Condor in the uh, closing days of the, uh, the 20th century, usually the way that we thought about tasks at the time was to say, well, I have a task. How do I find a machine that is compatible with that task? 
But of course, you all know that the world has changed and our machines have really grown in capacity. And so an HD condor pool is going to have, especially a heterogeneous one, is going to have machines of four or eight, 16, 256, or you know, it's, it won't be long before we see a thousand core machines. And although there are tasks that can run on a thousand cores, it's more common that they run in some fraction of the machine. And so the question is usually not which machine do I run my task on, but rather how many tasks can I pack into a given machine? So just to pick some uh, artificial numbers here, let's suppose I have a machine that has 12 cores and 12 gigabytes of RAM, and I have a very large number of tasks to run. How many tasks can I fit on that machine? Well, I have to decide how much memory to give each task. And in this case here, I've chosen, let's, let's give each task two gigabytes of memory. And if we do that, then we can fit in six tasks, and that's how many we can run. Now, you've got to get this number right, of course. If we underestimate and the task doesn't get enough memory, a variety of bad things can happen, right? If we, if we overcommit physical memory on the machine, uh, then your machine is just going to swap. It's going to start making squirrel noises, and everybody on the machine is going to get terrible performance. On the other hand, if we underallocate resources, then we're not going to be able to run as many tasks as we want. We're not going to get the throughput that we desire. So if two gigabytes is the right number for this task, then I can run six once, and that's going to control the throughput that I get out of this system. Now, maybe two isn't the right number. Maybe these tasks need more, and I discover that through some trial and error, and I discover that each of these tasks needs four gigabytes memory. Well, all right, that's fine. Then we can pack three tasks into one machine, and, and let's hope the tasks succeed. But now you can see that if we're only packing three tasks into a machine, we've almost certainly halved the throughput that we're going to get out of the system. So the resource allocation per task is very tightly coupled to the throughput achievable in a given system. Now, we could think about you know, one kind of task. Maybe these are all the same kind of simulation. And, and if we're lucky, maybe they all have the same resource consumption. But in a complicated workflow, you may have different kinds of tasks. So here we've got a couple tasks of type A, a couple tasks of type B. And the right solution may be to come up with different resource allocations for each type so that we can pack them in like this. Uh, and in fact, it may be desirable to leave some resources unallocated on a machine so that um, either we or another user can backfill the unused resources with tasks of a different type. Uh, Doug, uh, and maybe I missed it. Uh, what do you know about the runtime of these tasks? <laughs> well, uh, one one uh, problem. Because, be, because that's, that has been uh, a challenge of uh, scheduling what they call supercomputers from, from day one. But uh, when you don't know the runtime, then things are getting ugly pretty quickly. Um, so I, I think many of the same questions apply to runtime. Um, now, the, 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 the runtime is not an orthogonal problem. So usually when we start computing resource consumption and trying to make good decisions, we end up having to take our our, our predicted runtime and multiply by the other resources to figure out, you know, the multi-dimensional consumption. Uh, it, it's a good question. I'm not going to present a solution to that today. Um, I, I, okay. I, I think it's a fair question. Though. Okay, uh, we'll let time uh, tell us uh, when you have a solution. So if we're lucky, all the tasks behave the same way, but usually they don't. You know, what if you have it, task A has variable behavior, so you end up with a situation like this. All right, so some questions we want to ask about tasks. And in fact, we usually go to the user and say, hey, tell us. You're the expert on the application. Why don't you tell us how much memory does each task need? Go ahead and put it in your submit file. Uh, you're the expert on the application. Why don't you tell us how many cores each task needs? You're the expert on the application. Why don't you tell us whether it needs a GPU? Um, and, and in fairness to users, these are difficult questions to answer. Um, you know, un, un, unless, you, unless you're a very low level hacker, most people are not particularly interested in memory consumption as long as it runs on the machine that they have. The application runs on my laptop, I'm satisfied. How many cores does it need is actually very difficult to answer. Maybe if you're writing a multi-threaded application directly, you have control over that, but very frequently applications will rely on underlying libraries 
that then turn around and take advantage of uh, the available concurrency on the machine. So the user may not know or control it directly. You might even think that users know if they're using a GPU because that's so fundamental to the operation of a program. And clearly somebody who writes a CUDA program knows that they intend to use a GPU. But we now see applications of so many layers and stacks that someone can write a program and not even know if it happens to use TensorFlow deep in the stack of all of its components. So users don't necessarily know. And uh, you know we might as well be asking them, how many roads must a man walk down and, and expect a good answer from them? All right, so let me give you an example. So this application is called uh, uh, Colmena, comes from the University of Chicago, uh, 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 Logan Ward. And what Colmena is doing is it is combining uh, molecular simulations with machine learning techniques in order to, uh, 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 in order to optimize molecular designs. In this graph on the left over here, what, I've, what we've plotted is the memory consumption of tasks as they complete when they come back from the system. And as you can see here, there isn't a lot of regularity to what's going on. The first couple of tasks that complete an order consume you know, five gigabytes of memory or so. And there seems to be a sort of a cluster or a grouping there in the lower left, but there's a huge range of behavior all the way up to 30 gigabytes. And as the application runs, the distribution is all over the place. So this is, it's a surprisingly wide distribution, right? Because the smallest tasks consume maybe two gigabytes of memory and the largest ones almost 30. And so this is gonna have a huge effect of how we pack tasks. The graph on the right is just the same data, just sorted by memory consumption. All right, so what do we do about it? Well, let's, let's do the easiest thing first. I think the natural thing to do is to say, let's just take the maximum of the resource consumption of all these tasks. And that's what we should give them. So let's give each task 30 gigabytes of memory. Uh, well, we can do that. Uh, and, and I would say this is probably the number one strategy employed by users. Figure out that maximum and ask for it. Uh, and, and then all your tasks will succeed. And you know, if your metric is success in minimizing work, then this isn't a terrible idea. But of course, you're leaving a lot of throughput on the table because we're gonna have a lot of tasks that don't need anywhere near that memory. So maybe what we should do is pick a first estimate and try it. And if that first estimate works, great. And if it doesn't work, well, then the task fails and we can go to the maximum. So this isn't a bad strategy, but it still leaves open the question of where do you put that level? There's also the question of how many levels should we have? Is, is it worth it to have three or four? The answer depends a lot on the distribution, its, and, and its breadth, and how quickly you get information back. So the problem gets complicated quickly. Well, so what Tan has done here, and I'm, unfortunately in this short talk I can't explain the whole thing, but Tan has come up with a technique for figuring this out um, uh, incrementally at runtime. And so what he's done is to adapt some techniques from clustering. Uh, that estimate over time as information comes in what these attempt buckets should be. So what you see in this animation is tasks finishing. As each task finishes, we get its resource consumption. And the blue line that's evolving shows you the, the best first estimate for allocating memory. And if that succeeds, great. But if the task fails doing that, then we go up and we attempt the yellow line, which is the maximum of everything that's been seen so far. And so this, this is the result of that algorithm on the Colmena data. And you can see that it converges fairly quickly uh, on, 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 on that first attempt where the blue line is. Furthermore, you can see it, it's about, uh, about half of the maximum. And so in, in the best case here, we ought to be able to run twice as many applications. Now, if you don't believe me that this is common, I could show you some more applications here. Here's another one, top EFT, that has a similar kind of crazy behavior. And then, of course, we generated a bunch of synthetic distributions uh, to see how this algorithm performed on, on all of those things. And uh, so the top line result here is, is we computed the efficiency. Now, the efficiency is what fraction of the resource allocated did the task use? And so high efficiency is better because we're not leaving resources unused. And so the effect of this algorithm 
uh, between just assigning the whole machine and doing k-means bucketing was a very dramatic increase in efficiency. So on top EFT, we got as high as 91%. In coal main, we got as high as 43%. Now, of course, we don't ever expect that efficiency to be 100% because there's such a wide distribution. You're always going to have cases where you assign an allocation to a task uh, and it doesn't need all of it. So we call this um, fitting eggs into our nest. How many of these eggs can we fit into the nest? Now, this isn't the only strategy that you might use. So let me go a different direction here. So this is uh, the top EFT uh, data analysis application for CMS. And very briefly, what this does is it's um, consuming uh, events from the, from the CMS detector here. Each event is on the order of kilobytes, and we've got terabytes to peta petabytes of this stuff. And I hope I don't offend any high energy physics uh, practitioners in the, in the audience by saying what happens is we compute complex properties of these events, selecting the ones that are of interest, and then aggregate them into histograms at the end. So we have a bunch of processing functions that find and analyze the interesting things, and then accumulation functions that produce the histograms. Now, a similar sort of thing happens here. You can see over on the left hand side here that the, um, the memory consumption of each task is sort of correlated to the number of events that you process. It looks sort of linear, but there's a, there's, a, there's a large spread there. So how do we go about choosing the right amount of memory for a task? Well, it's a different problem because we can choose how big our tasks can be, how many files they should process. So we're gonna turn the problem around. What we're going to do is to set a target of memory consumption and then choose the task size to achieve that target. So this display here shows the general strategy. Up in the right-hand corner, what we can do is develop a regression that predicts the memory consumption of a task based on what arbitrary size that we give it. So now what the workflow system does is it will choose the right size of task to achieve a given memory a target. It will then run the task. If the task fits inside that allocation, great, we're done. If the task is too small, well, that's okay, we let it run, but we add its data to the distribution and that will help us make better predictions in the future. If the task is too large, it will fail. So we split it in half and run the two halves separately. And again, add the data to our distribution. And the effect of this is that the system is self-optimizing over time. So there are two examples here. On the top, we have an example of a system that started with too small of a task size. And by observing the resource consumption, grew it to the desired size so that our tasks would fit inside allocations of two gigabytes. So you can see the orange line starting on the left and then going up starts at a very small 1K and eventually tops out at close to 128K, uh, which gives us tasks of two gigabytes. On the bottom, we have the opposite thing happening. Um, we have uh, a target memory size of one gigabytes, and initially our chunk size is too large, it's 256K and it fairly quickly uh, converges to a smaller chunk size in order to achieve a target memory of one gigabyte. So that's an example of uh, changing the size of the eggs in order to fit in the nest. All right, so to recap, how many eggs can we fit in a nest? Turns out that applications have surprisingly complex resource distributions. You would think if someone says, I have a bunch of tasks, they're all the same, that they would behave the same. Well, they don't. And uh, in, it's not really reasonable to ask end users to figure this out for themselves. And so what we're arguing is that it's really the job of the workflow layer to aggregate observations about these tasks and then predict appropriate resource allocations. You can think of it either way. You can say, let us um, fit the nest to the eggs by dynamically changing the task allocations. Or you can say, let's fit the nest to the eggs by dynamically changing the task definitions to hit resource targets. Now, um, all this works, and it's been integrated in, in, in various ways into real applications. Um, and so we're happy that that's, that's all working, but there is a continuing challenge. And, and one of it, it, it's really about presenting the right information to users. So uh, we're, we're always struggling to figure out how much, users do, how much information do users really want to know in order to run their applications. And a real challenge of this sort of system is to just present everything possible. And, and I've seen many times uh, where, where the user of this application, this sort of application is just sort of turned off by seeing the cockpit of a B-52 
uh, where every possible bit of information is presented to them and, and, and they don't know what to do. And of course, we can err in the other direction by having a check engine light for applications that just says, I think something's wrong, better call the expert. And that's not really effective either. Uh, and, and so we're, we're constantly experimenting with how to present the right things uh, to our users. This is our current display. In the middle, it shows uh, the, the uh, so the slate blue shows the number of resources in use. The lighter blue shows the number of resources allocated. So if there's a gap between the two, you know, there's a potential inefficiency there. And the white shows the number of resources that we think we could use effectively at maximum scale. So we're, we're always experimenting with different ways of presenting just enough information to the user so they can be more effective. I think that's my time. Uh, so if that sounds interesting to you, you can check out our web pages here. Uh, my name is Douglas Thane, uh, and, and let me thank uh, Ben Tovar and Tan Fung for contributing to this. Um, thanks very much, and I'd be happy to take questions.